Sardis. I am delighted to welcome you here today on this beautiful, sunny, almost maybe spring day. If you will stand with me for our opening song, our call to worship, let us sing, O Worship the King. Well, good morning and welcome to Sardis Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here this morning. Uh, as you look on your bulletin this morning, we want to let you know about some upcoming announcements. We know that recently there hasn't been much to announce, but we are slowly beginning to get back to some kind of normal, and we would encourage you to look over those announcements yourselves. Uh, we have a men's and women's Bible study that's going to be starting up the first of the month and the evening, so we'd love for you to attend those. We also have a very special day coming up we've talked about briefly called Vision Sunday, and it's going to be kind of an explanation and overview of what's coming up next uh, that we hope is God's plan for Sardis Baptist Church. So it'll be a very exciting day, a wonderful day, not just for that reason, but also because we'll be restarting our Sunday school classes at 10 a.m. And so we'd love for you to get back to attending with your class if you're comfortable, and we'd love to see you. I know your teachers would too as well. Uh, as you open your bulletin this morning, you'll see there's a visitor information card. That's our way to connect with you and to know more about you. And if you could do us the favor of filling that out and then giving it to Pastor Michael or myself before you leave today, we'd love the chance to minister to you and your family. At this time, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the warmer weather we're beginning to see, the sunny days to go outside and, uh, and do work together. Father, thank you so much for the gifts and the opportunities you've given us to serve one another uh, as a body of Christ. As we slowly begin to uh, reopen God from classes and programs, uh, different ministries, Father, we pray for health and for wellness and for safety. And we pray, God, that most especially we would get back in the habit of meeting together. Whether we're here for the first time in a long time today or watching from home, Father, it is so important for the Lord's people to be together and to meet together. Uh, Father, thank you for this opportunity today to do that. As we hear Pastor Michael here in a few moments, hell our hearts and our minds be open to his word. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Before I sing, I'd like to read to you from John 21, verses 15 through 17. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to be making your way to the book of Revelation, chapter, chapter 1. It'll be the last book in your New Testament. Again, if you are new to Bible study, I do want to, before we start, uh, make one correction from last week. I had said last week that we were going to spend last week and this week getting through chapter 1 before we launch off into the study of these seven churches. Well... I've been preaching long enough to know I probably shouldn't make those kind of promises, so uh, we will not. We're going to have at least one more week in chapter one after uh, today. There was just uh, there's just a lot in here that I didn't want to just blow over real fast, so I thought we'll just back up and slow it down. Uh, we're not in a race, and so uh, so we'll spend at least at least one more week uh, in this book. But today, as we continue in our series entitled Christ's Zeal for His Church. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11 this morning in Revelation chapter 1. And God's Word says this, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos on account of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and 
Send it to the seven churches in Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you so much. Father, for the honor and the privilege to be here this morning to come and to open up your word. And Father, I do pray today, God, as we study your word, Lord, that you would, God, give us a fresh perspective this morning, one that we all need uh, to have. Father, we pray that you'd give us ears to hear this morning what the Spirit, your Spirit, has to say to us. And Father, and we pray as always for the one who may be here today who is lost and who's never received Christ, who's never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, that you would use what is said here this morning to give them eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would draw them eternally to yourself. But bless, Father, we ask to bless your people for your glory and our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I think we would all agree this morning that uh, we uh, Americans are a, a unique people. I think we would all agree with that, and we're unique in this way. I don't think there's uh, any doubt that we would all agree that we are blessed to live in what I would consider the greatest country that God has ever created. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. We also... Uh, live in what is considered the most powerful and the wealthiest country that has ever been created. And so because of that, uh, we're a unique people and living in a unique context. And while all of these things, these benefits, certainly have a lot of upside to them, right? I would also submit to you that there's a lot of downside to it as well. And the downside shows up when we begin to read and understand our Bibles. You see, one of the greatest downsides to being an American Christian is that we constantly have to fight uh, to have a proper biblical perspective on what it means uh, to live a kingdom-minded life. It's a constant battle for us. So often, so many believe that this American Christian life is the norm. This is how it's supposed to be. This is how it should be. Now, the only problem with that thinking is, is that history and the Word of God really tells a different story. You know, I've often said, and you've probably heard me say it, that we here in America... As Christians in America, we are uh, the exception and not the rule. We live the exception in terms of our Christian existence compared to uh, so many others all over this world and certainly down through history. We're, we're the exception, not the rule. And so because of that, we here must fight to maintain a proper biblical perspective on kingdom living, to keep in balance all the blessings that we have and to understand very clearly that those blessings can be taken from us and that would be completely normal. It would be completely normal. Well, John here in the text that we are going to look at this morning, John is going to give us an opportunity this morning to help us kind of sharpen our perspective on some things. You know, if we, if we were to retitle our study in the book of Revelation, we could retitle it and call it, uh, you know, uh, Everyday Christian Living. It could be a study in the book of Revelation, Everyday Christian Living, or, uh, I like this one, or uh, a study in the book of Revelation, uh, No Room for Prosperity Teachers. Now, we can name... Our study that. Why? Because John gives us a very clear eye, I think, view of what normative Christian life is like for so many across this world and down through history. And friends, that life 
that normative Christian life that so many live. That life is very hard for us to imagine uh, in the context that we live in. It's very hard for us to kind of get our minds around uh, this normative Christian life because it's very much unfamiliar to us in the context in which we live. Again, this is not to beat us up. Again, like I said before, none of us asked to be born here. God just put us here. Right? The providence of God put us here. It is God who elevated this country to what it is. It is God who has given us all the blessings that we have. But yet we still need to understand those blessings in their proper context and in their proper perspective. And so I want us just to take some time this morning and look at uh, a couple of things. One, I want us to look at John's context or his situation uh, that he is in as he writes this letter. And then I want us to look for a moment at, his, uh, at the command that he received to write the letter. His commissioning, if you will, uh, to write the letter. Just so you're aware, I'm going to spend the vast majority of our time on the first point. So when it gets to be about 10 minutes to 12 and I'm still on point one, don't freak out. I'll get through the second point pretty, pretty quick. So let's look at John's context or, or his situation, if you will, as he pens this letter and see if we can discover something about uh, the normative Christian life. Again, go back, uh, to verse, go back to verse 9 real quick and let's just look at it again. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. All right? So as we come to this verse, one of the things that just leaps off the page at us, we are reminded of really this twofold reality uh, of the kingdom of God. Now, if you were here last week, uh, you will recall, I hope, uh, that we talked about how we as Christians, we exist, right, in kind of this two realities, right? There's this eternal or this ultimate reality in which we uh, live in or exist in. Then there's also uh, a kind of a, another reality, a more temporal reality, one that we live each and every day uh, of our lives. And John, if you recall from last week, if you weren't here, you didn't see it, I would encourage you to go online and look at it. But John, as a means of encouragement to these churches to whom he is writing, he reminded them of some things in verses 1 through 8. He reminded them of some truths concerning God, right? And so in doing so, and in doing that, we are reminded that our ultimate victory as Christians, as Christians, our ultimate victory has been won. Right? Our future is secure regardless of what's going on in this world. Our future as believers is absolutely secure and there is nothing, nothing going to change that. There's absolutely nothing that will change that. No matter what this life may throw at us, the fact remains that those who are in Christ, that we are eternally secure and our futures have been guaranteed, right? And so they've not been guaranteed because of us or because of anything we have done or will do. They've been guaranteed for us because King Jesus has won and secured our future for us. And again, nothing, nothing's going to change that. That's our ultimate and eternal reality that we exist in, right? That is true for us. And again, that's always going to be true. And so... <clears throat> In that, again, we come to understand that there's some ultimate and unchanging things about our lives as it pertains to the kingdom of God. However, when we come here to verse 9, John seems to switch on us. He makes a, he makes a pivot, and he switches gears. And in this text of Scripture that we're looking at here, we are reminded of another reality to kingdom living. And this other reality as it pertains to our lives as we walk through this life or as we sojourn through this world as believers. 
There's another reality there that we, we have to come to grips with. And we have to come to terms with it. And as we look at these two realities, the contrast between the two could not be sharper. It could not be more stark. So let's walk through this verse here and see, what, uh, and see what's going on. And try to help, get, uh, help us get a little bit better perspective this morning. I want you to notice the first thing is the humility to which John comes at this topic. All right, as he addresses these churches. Notice first he says, I, John. All right, so if you, to understand what John is saying here, he's, he's saying this, I, John. He's, it's like he's surprised, you know. You know, I'm the one receiving this vision. This is kind of the, the idea that he, that he has here. It's like shock, all right? So there's a humility, uh, a, hu- uh, a humility that John has right here. He's, he's a little shocked. And he's the one that's receiving uh, this vision. But then notice also that John identifies himself, how? As a brother. All right? He identifies himself as a brother. Now, John, uh, he did not set himself apart as an apostle, which he was, but instead he chose uh, in writing this letter to uh, identify himself, uh, to have some solidarity with those to whom he is writing, to his readers. John did not write to these believers as one who was impressed with the, you know, his authority as an apostle. Now, he certainly had authority, no doubt. But that's not what he chooses to highlight. Instead, he chooses to identify himself instead, how? As a brother. As a brother. Why did he do this? Well, we can't know for sure exactly why he chose to do this. But we do know that he is following a very familiar pattern that we see in the New Testament. And that pattern is this, that those people who are believers, those who have been born again, those who have been adopted into the family of God, right? Those who are redeemed become part of the larger family of God. And in that, we call each other brothers and sisters, right? We're brothers and sisters uh, in Christ, right? We, we have a family, but we're also part of a larger family. And this is a pattern that we see going uh, through uh, the New Testament. And John is simply uh, staying with that pattern. So that could be one reason why he chose to do it. However, another reason may be he wanted to identify with them because it probably brought them comfort and also brought himself comfort to be able to identify with these believers in this way. See, leadership, you know, for John, leadership can be a, a lonely thing. And John, in his capacity as an apostle, has been out front, and he's been leading the church, and he has been dealing with all the stuff that comes with leading the church, and now he finds himself in much the same situation as those he leads. And so he chooses to identify with them as a means of connecting in a way that is more personal. Right? It's a way of connecting in a way that not only would, would bring them comfort, but also bring himself comfort. And so whatever the reasons were that John chose to humble himself and identify himself this way, we know he's relating to them on a very personal level. But then he reinforces this connection that he has with his readers. Not only does he call himself a brother, but then he adds this uh, kind of another layer of identifying with them by using the term partner. All right? Brother and partner. Now here, in this little section, is where I hope we're going to start getting a little bit of uh, perspective on the normative Christian life. Notice what he says. He says he is a partner with them, what? In the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Now, there's a ton of stuff packed in in that little verse right there. And I'm not going to be able to unpack all of it. But let me just kind of give you a flavor, if I can, of what exactly John is telling us here. First thing I want you to notice, John says he he identifies with them in their tribulation. All right, so 
John does not stand over them in a way that he can't relate to their suffering. John can actually come to these churches and he can say, hey, because they're suffering and they're facing persecution. And John could actually come to them and say, hey, I know what you're feeling. I know what you're going through. And he can mean it when he says it. Because he himself is suffering greatly. He tells them that at the time that he is writing this letter, he has been exiled to this island of of Patmos on account of what? Uh, On account of his faithfulness to preach and to proclaim the Word of God and to faithfully proclaim and pronounce the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why he's there. In other words, John has been exiled and John is facing persecution not because he done something wrong, right? but because he did something right. That's why he's facing it. Matter of fact, John is not facing persecution and suffering because he's outside the will of God. As a matter of fact, he is facing suffering and persecution because he's in the dead center of God's will. Kind of goes against the grain, doesn't it? Kind of goes against what we're told. He is suffering for faithfulness. How many of us have had you know, the, the, the law come knock at our door and drag us out of our houses and take all of our worldly possessions and throw us in a jail somewhere just because we're Christians or just because we've been out faithfully proclaiming the Word of God? How many of us has that happened to? None. How many of us have lost our jobs because our boss found out we were Christians? It hadn't probably happened to any of us. But yet this is the reality of so many in the world in which we live today. This was also the reality for those uh, to whom John was writing. You see, he's suffering, and so are they, uh, for their faithfulness. And you can walk through the pages of Scripture, and you will find example after example of this very thing happening. We see Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. Why? Because of his faithfulness. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown into the furnace. Why? Because of their faithfulness. Right? You can go through uh, the disciples. Every one of them suffered. Why? Because of their faithfulness. Paul, same thing. Jesus himself suffered. Why? Because of his faithfulness. Because he was in the dead center of God's will. That's why they suffer. In other words, he's suffering here, John is, for the same reasons that those to whom he is writing is suffering. Because of their faithfulness. And in that, he is partnering with them in the tribulation. And then he says that he is a partner with them not only in the tribulation, but also in the kingdom. And it's here that he reminds his readers that they are part of the same dominion of salvation. That they are part of the same community of the redeemed over which Jesus Christ is Lord. They're part of that same kingdom. And so he partners with them in that. And then he also includes that he is a partner with them in patient endurance. And this here speaks to the idea of having a perseverance. All right? It literally means to remain under. All right? Well, to remain under what is really the question. Well, John is telling them that he is a partner with them in enduring difficulties without giving up, without giving in, and without compromising. He is enduring under the pressure, and he's going to partner with them. John is telling them that he isn't set apart as some protected class of Christians who know nothing of persecution. That would be most of us, wouldn't it? We've never faced persecution. The suffering we suffer is what's common to all people. But suffering for our faith. Suffering to be, because we're Christians, that's a whole nother level. You see, his apostolic status did not protect John from suffering and persecution. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for it. And here's the perspective we here in America, I believe, struggle with so often. But it's here... And it's this perspective that we need to come to grips with. And we need to try to understand it because the Scripture teaches it clearly. Look at what John is saying. 
He says that he is their partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Now let me give you a, a quick little uh, a Greek lesson here. In, in the original language here where this passage is found, in the Greek language there's only one definite article that ties all those words together. All right, so in English, they use uh, the definite article, the. They use it three times for each, for each thing. In the Greek, there's only one. So it would read something like, you know, he's their partner in the tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. All right? And you say, okay, so what? Right? Why does that, why does that matter? Here's why it matters. It matters because what this text is showing us is that these three things are boxed together. They go together. All right? You can't have one without the other. Or to put it another way, these three things belong together as part of one reality, and that is uh, the kingdom reality here on earth. You see, like John, every other Christian faces tribulation. And they receive a kingdom. And advance from one, that is tribulation, to the other, that is to the kingdom, by patient endurance. Let me give you a couple of verses to support it. Jesus promised very clearly in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. He said, the one who endures, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Paul says over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, he says, if we endure... We will also reign with Him. All right, and then notice John makes the point that tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance are all done how? In Jesus, right? Meaning that suffering persecution for the cause of Christ and belonging to His kingdom and patiently enduring uh, trials and difficulties is a distinctly Christian experience. It goes together, is what he's saying. Acts chapter 14 and verse 22 reminds us very clearly that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And we see over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he says, And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in the faith. That no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourself know that we were destined for this. Right? The church was destined for this. The same thing Paul is writing there in Thessalonians is the same thing John is writing here in Revelation. He's writing him, he's telling him, look, don't give in. Don't allow the hardship and the suffering and the persecution to cause you to bend the knee to this culture. Endure. You're destined for this. This is what the church is made for. This is our purpose, is what he's saying. And here we have this great contrast, right? Between our ultimate reality, which is outside of us, it's our eternal reality that God has for us in heaven, and the reality that we have, that so many have anyway, right here on earth. And here, we also see the perspective that we should have as Christians, what he's telling us here, we should expect this. We should expect it. The church, again, was made for this. And yet, even as I'm talking, I can see the looks on your faces. This is so far from our thinking, isn't it? This is so far from anything we ever think about. that actually, it makes little sense to us to even stand up here and talk about it. It's so far from our reality and where we live each and every day of our life. Again, it's like I said last week, we've, we've had the luxury of allowing these suffering and persecution passages, we can just gloss over them because they really have little relevance to our life. You know, and some people will hear preaching like this and they'll say, man, that sure is negative, isn't it? You know? They may say, Man, that sure is some negative way to look at life. Well, guess what? They only say that here. <laughs> There's places all over this world where they don't say that at all. They identify with it very clearly. You see, in the purpose, 
The purpose of being reminded of this is not to be negative. Quite honestly, it's just to help us out. The purpose is to prepare us that if or when suffering comes, that we're not shaken by it. That we're not seeing it as something that's strange, that shouldn't be happening to us. No, friend, this is the normative Christian life. And the fact that we have been spared up to this point is all because of the good grace of our God that He has spared us from this. And I hope, I hope you make it a habit of thanking Him for that each and every day of your life. Because this is not normal. This is not normal. You see, so many simply expect God to give us this kind of life. Why? Because it's all we've ever known. Again, we think this is normal. This is normal. But what happens is so many in the church are looking uh, to this kingdom, the kingdom of this world, for the peace that this world promises. And actually, it's a false peace that it promises. This world has never or uh, was never intended to be our ultimate source of peace. Yet so many look for it to be. But yet you contrast that with the kingdom. And what we're told about the kingdom, the kingdom of God actually promises tribulation. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have, not maybe, but you will have tribulation. We're promised that. And yet at the same time, it's in the midst of that tribulation that God does deliver to us His peace and His salvation and His ability to help us to endure and to stand under the pressure without giving in. You see, those of us in America, if we're honest, those of us in this country, we have everything that the world says we're supposed to have to have peace in our lives and be happy. And yet as you look out into this world, in our culture, there are so few who have peace and who are happy. So many today feel that their world is simply slipping away. All that they've ever known is slipping away. And the world and their life, as they've always known it, is slipping away. And guess what's slipping away with it? Their peace and their happiness. And we're seeing the reaction of so many as that's happening. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to handle it. Why? Because we lack perspective so often in what God's Word tells us. The fact that the world is coming down on us, or starting, we're starting to feel a little bit of the squeeze, friends, is completely normal. It is absolutely completely normal for the Christian life. See, friends, don't buy into the lie. Do not buy into the lie that says uh, you can have your best life now. <laughs> as John MacArthur said, if you got your best life now, that means you're going to hell when you die if this is as good as it gets. And Lord, help us if this is as good as it gets. Don't buy into the lie that says you can have your best life now. Be thankful to God for the life that He has given to us, absolutely. And defend it. With all you have. All right, the things that we fight for, the things that matter to us, Christian principles, we need to be out in the highways and byways. We need to be defending it and speaking it and doing all that we can uh, to, to defend our way of life. But listen, don't be surprised if it doesn't last. Don't let it shake you. I'm not saying be happy about it. But don't look at it as something unusual. Or something foreign to Scripture. You see, this life has purpose. The trials of this life have purpose. And that purpose is to prepare us for what God has for us, right? The trials and the suffering and the heartache and all the things that we experience in this life is a very clear reminder to us that this world is ultimately not our home. That we have an ultimate reality that we live in, that exists for us. And for now, we endure. And we endure and we stand under. We patiently endure whatever afflictions come our way. And as we 
do that, we follow in the footsteps of so many. The Old Testament prophets, the disciples, Jesus himself, and the overwhelming majority of believers who have gone down through the centuries. As we endure and as we patiently endure, we follow in their footsteps. You know, that is the perspective that we need to have as we think about and look out into our world. Not be fearful, but just have the right perspective. Now, I could go on with this for the next month, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move, I'm gonna move on because uh, i got something else to say here. So we see that uh, John's giving us a new kind of perspective about kingdom living on this earth. But then look in verses 10 and 11. And here we see John's commission or his command uh, to write. Notice what he says in verse 10. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. And then he lists the seven churches he wants it sent to. And so here John, he's just shared with us in verse 9, really, what is uh, a normative for the Christian life. Well, here in verse 10 and following, we see something that is certainly not normal at all, don't we? Something that's John's, that uh, John is doing that is not normal at all. We see in verse 10, it says that he was, what, in the Spirit. All right, let's just park on that for a second. This, this may get me in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's an interesting uh, interesting phrase here, in the Spirit, that has somewhat been hijacked uh, today. Uh, and it means something <clears throat> that it was really never intended uh, to mean. Let me just give you some context of what's happening here. And if you go through uh, the book of Revelation and you study through it, there are four places in the book, in the letter, that, uh, that John records that he was in the Spirit. And each time it's recorded, it begins a, a significant moment in a vision that John received. And so when you read the book of Revelation, you got to think of it not kind of in sequential order, but you think of it in terms of these different visions that John has, uh, that he's receiving. So it's almost like he's looking through a window and he's receiving this vision and he's writing down what he sees. And so we have these, these four instances here of when he says he was in the Spirit. We see it, this phrase used here. Uh, in uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 10, where uh, John is about to see a vision of the risen Christ. All right, we're going to see that next week. If you go over to chapter 4, we see the phrase used where John is getting a vision of the heavenly courts. Then you go over to chapter 17, and we see uh, John beginning to see, he gets a vision of the beginning of the fall of the great harlot Babylon. Then over in chapter 21, we see uh, the phrase used again, where John shows, uh, or he's, he's shown the descent of the new Jerusalem. All right? So each one of these visions begins with, he was in the Spirit. All right? He was in the Spirit. And so what we see here, as John is in the Spirit, we see John receiving uh, these visions, these special revelation uh, of visions. Right? What we don't see... This is where it might get me in trouble, but I'm going to do it anyway. What we don't see is John being in the Spirit and acting weird. Okay? We don't see him doing that. We don't see John in the Spirit, uh, you know, running around the sanctuary, taking his jacket off and slinging his jacket over his head and just acting strange. We don't see that at all, do we? We don't see John in the Spirit, you know, jogging in place or falling on the floor and rolling around and laughing uncontrollably. No, we don't see that at all, do we? That's not what being in the Spirit is all about. Right? You know, I can remember watching, you can go to YouTube and see some of this stuff. I was watching a video on YouTube not too long ago, and it was this... Uh, it was a video of this church service, a little small little church. And there was this little old man standing up behind the pulpit singing. And there was another guy standing next to him playing, uh, playing the guitar. And he, as soon as that old man starts singing, man, grown men stand up in the congregation. 
And they start shouting and running around the sanctuary, screaming and hollering, getting excited, throwing their coat over their head. One guy got so uh, excited that he swung his jacket and it landed on the guy that was singing. And he got so worked up that he came up on the platform, jumped over into the choir loft and made his way into the baptistry. And the baptistry had water in it, by the way. And he would say he was in the Spirit. And he was in the Spirit. If you'd study some of the charismatic stuff that has gone on down through church history, what you will find, there's a couple of, and I'll put it in air quotes, revivals that supposedly were mentioned. There was one called the Laughing Revival. And that is where people supposedly got in the Spirit and they started laughing and they couldn't stop. Uncontrollable laughing, rolling around the floors. There was one called uh, the Barking <laughs> Revival, if you can imagine. And what this was, grown people, grown men and women, supposedly got in the Spirit, got on all fours like a dog and started barking. So much, in fact, some of them went outside the church building and went up to a tree and was barking up the tree like a coon dog does, saying that they had treed the devil. <laughs> Friends, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. He takes that which is chaotic and He brings order to it, not the other way around. When a person is in the Spirit, and not to go out and act strange and weird. All these crazy distortions are not what it means to be in the Spirit. You want to be in the Spirit? Do what God's Word tells you to do. Being in the Spirit means obedience. It means practicing the church, uh, uh, the, uh, the spiritual disciplines that we've been given of prayer and of studying His Word and of fasting and those kinds of things. That's what being in the Spirit's all about. It's not acting strange what's happening here with John and him being in the spirit is something very unique okay John like the Old Testament prophets was in a supernatural state of inspiration remember you got to understand what's going on here God has given us his word at this moment right his word is still being written and so he takes uh, these people these special messengers and he reveals what he wants to reveal to them. Again, this is not something that is common to all of us. This is common, though, or saved for God's special messengers. We see it over uh, in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 12. Listen to this. It says, Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me the voice of a great earthquake. Isn't that amazing? Guess what? John here in this vision is hearing the same voice. From behind him. Ezekiel said it sounded like an earthquake. John says it sounds like a trumpet. Same voice. And so this idea of being in the Spirit here, as it's described here, is something very special. And so he says he was in the Spirit. And then it says he was in the Spirit when? On the Lord's Day. It's here quite simply. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into it. It's just a reference to Sunday morning. All right? This is the day that the apostles moved, the day of Christian worship from Saturday to Sunday to commemorate the resurrection of our Lord. It's the Lord's Day. It's not the day of the Lord. Some think he's referring to the day of the Lord. That is the great tribulation and all that. That's what he's talking about. But the two different phrases. Uh, it's uh, the Lord's Day. He's speaking of Sunday. But then notice this. Then John hears a voice. And the voice gives him a command. And the command says this, write what you see in the book. Write what you see. So this was a very loud and sharp and uh, a clear clarion call for what Christ wanted John to do. This was the command of Jesus to John. In other words, Jesus didn't stutter and he didn't stammer in his command. He was very clear in what he wanted John to do. John tells us right here that we have the book of Revelation. Why? Because Christ commanded it. And he obeyed and wrote down uh, what he was supposed to write down. In other words, this is not John using his imagination or making stuff up. Uh, trying to make things out the way he wanted them to be. No. 
He's obeying what Jesus said. It is a clear command from Christ. It is John being obedient. And here's the point. That obedience extends to us as well. It extends to us as well. The same Christ that commanded John is the same Christ that commands us as well. Obedience is required of us all. I love how one writer puts it this way. He says, Revelation exists because Jesus called John to write. The church exists because Jesus is the good shepherd who calls his sheep by name and they follow him. Missionaries go to the ends of the earth. Why? Because Jesus said go and make disciples. Christians are faithful in their marriages. Why? Because Jesus said what God has joined together. Let no man separate. Christians are to love one another. Why? Because Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And the list goes on and on. Friends, listen. You have to understand that to disobey Christ in any of these areas or in any area that He has commanded us in His Word is to disobey, not a book, but it is to disobey the voice of our risen Lord. That's how serious it is. And he's amazed here at what's going on and what he is being commanded to do. And here's the deal with John's obedience. It is amazing that John's situation here, it didn't hinder his obedience, did it? John didn't say, well, you know, Lord, I I hear what you're saying, but right now I can't write this stuff down because, you know, I'm in a bit of a pinch here. I don't know if you know it or not, but I'm suffering a little bit here. Lord, I would love to serve you, but right now I got got some other things going on. I got my kids to raise or haul off to a ball field somewhere. I I got some other stuff that needs to happen before I can... Become obedient. Then, Lord, I'll do it. That's not what John did at all. His situation did not affect his obedience one bit, did it? He was in a hard and difficult situation, and yet he obeyed. John was commanded, and he simply obeyed. And so it needs to be with us as well. And what we're going to see as we walk through these chapters and these seven churches... What we're going to see in this book is that Christ is summoning forth obedience from His churches. And that obedience doesn't end with just the seven churches to whom John is writing. No, friend, that obedience extends all the way to Hartwell, Georgia, to Sardis Baptist Church as well. Let me me wrap this up with this right here. See, what John is doing here is he is uh, he's taking these churches and he is opening their eyes beyond their present troubles. And what he is doing, he is pointing them back to an all-wise and all-sovereign God who is the ruler over all history, including the very thing that they are going through in that moment. And friend, that same God rules today. The God we serve, the God we say we serve, is the same God who is sovereign and wise and rules over all of history. And He is completely sovereign over everything that is happening in our world today. Nothing's changed. The truth, that truth that John would write about, would encourage these believers to not just endure their trouble. Not just to endure their suffering but to actually have victory in the midst of it. Right? It's not just this begrudging uh, uh, you know, existence, but they would actually have victory in their suffering, and that victory would spur them on to a greater levels of obedience. And friend, that's got to be true for us as well. So let me ask you this morning, where are your eyes focused today? Where are your eyes focused? Is your life and the passions of your life consumed with the problems that we see in our culture? Again, as important as those problems are. It's not saying we stick our head in the sand and pretend like they're not happening. No, we do. 
But are they consuming your life? As if there's nothing else. And I'm telling you, there's so many that are that way. And what was true, see, for these seven churches are just as true for us today. And what we're going to see moving forward through this study is a glorious God who has a mission for His church. And that mission is not altered because things get tough here on earth. The Great Commission does not have any caveats on it. He says, go and make disciples, period. Nothing has changed. Sardis, we are not off the hook because life in America is not like it used to be. It doesn't give us an out. Right? The one who uh, is on his throne is still exactly like he used to be. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And His mission for us does not change because things outside the walls of this church may be getting a little bit squirrely. Obedience and the mission are still the same. You know, I was reading this morning, and I'm going to close with this. I found this, and it just really resonated with me. And it said this, that God's revealed will, God's revealed will is our duty, right? That is His Word. His Word is His revealed will. And it is our duty and our obligation to obey it. There's no out in that. So, so God's revealed will is our duty. But God's providential will can be our comfort. You know, and as I was thinking about that, I think about the providential will for all of our lives in this room and how God providentially put each one of us in this country. And He's allowed us to live in the greatest country that's ever been created. And we live in comfort and ease, relatively speaking, for the rest of the world. That's God's providential will for our life. And there's great comfort in that. Then it goes on to say this, Never let that which is your comfort keep you from that which is your duty. Don't let all the trappings of the American life keep us from what God has commanded us to do in His Word. Keep the perspective in front of you all the time. And I'm telling you, as a Christian in America, you've got to battle for it. You've got to fight for it. But it's there. And it's my prayer that we would be found faithful in what God has called us to do. Amen? All right. Let's bow your heads and close your eyes. and We come to a moment of, of invitation. And friend, if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ and you've never received Christ as Lord and Savior, as I say every week, these promises are not for you. The promises of God are for His people. The promises of God are for those who have been saved, those who have repented of their sins and have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. And if that is you today, and if you've never received Christ, friend, listen to me. That can all change in a moment. That can all change right where you are sitting. The Bible says that Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And friend, if that is the condition of your heart, if right now God is revealing to you that you're lost and in need of a Savior, and you're in need to be saved, friend, don't harden your heart. Cry out right where you are. Ask God to forgive you. Receive the free gift of grace that He offers to everyone who will ask. And your life, both now and for eternity, can be forever changed. And all the promises that we have in Christ can be yours. If you will but call. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. Again, I invite you to come down. I'd love to have some time to speak with you about that decision. If you're a Christian in need of a church home, 
Friend, the doors of this church are open and we invite you to come and we'd love to be able to speak with you about what it means to be a member here at Sardis. But see, for the vast majority of us who are here and who are saved, friends, I'm just imploring you to keep a proper perspective on what's going on in this world. God has not abandoned us He has not abdicated His throne. He is still in complete control of it all. It may look different to us down here, but friends, God is working His eternal and sovereign plan out. We just need to trust Him with it. And whatever that looks like for our lives, But we are called to obedience. And may it be so. Father, again, thank You so much for your goodness and grace in our life, Father. We thank you for your word. And Lord, and I pray today, God, for the one who may be here who's never trusted Christ, that today would be the day. Father, I pray for the one who is wandering, the Christian who may be in need of a church family, Father. I pray that if this is the place you would have them to come, Lord, that you would give them the courage of that conviction to come. But Father, I pray for all of us in the room who are Christians, who are worried and concerned about all the things that we see. Father, I pray that our faith in You and our trust in You would consume our fears. And Father, while we may not like what we see happening, Father, may You remind us afresh this morning that Father, all this is temporary. What you have for us, what you have won for us is eternal. And Lord, help us to rest in that reality. So bless, Father, this time of invitation. And we'll give you the glory for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would just stand to your feet. When we walk with the Lord in the Before we are dismissed, I'm just going to leave you standing for just a second. Karen and Sean, would y'all come to the front here for me for a minute, please? I don't know if y'all know it, uh, but this is their last Sunday with us. Uh, jobs have a way of taking people away uh, from, uh, from us, and so they are going to be moving and heading to Missouri. Oklahoma and then Missouri. So, uh, so I just wanted to take a moment, one, to thank them for all their service that they've rendered so faithfully here to our church, and uh, and to have a moment to uh, to pray with them as they uh, as they get ready to go uh, and follow uh, where they are, uh, where God is leading them. So let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, again, we thank you so much for this dear couple, God, and for what the. Uh, One, for their heart for you, Lord, for their love for you that is so evident in their life. Father, for the years of service that they have rendered here to Sardis Baptist Church so faithfully. And Father, we do pray as they go and as they they move away. Father, I pray that you would give them traveling mercies. Lord, I pray for all the details that have to go on and all the chaos that comes with moving. But Father, we pray that you would just prepare the way for them. And Lord, and when they get to the place to where they're going, Father, I pray that you would just open a door uh, to the church, Father, where you would have them to go and to serve. And Lord, that that church could be a blessing to them, as I know that they will be a blessing uh, to the church that they serve. And so, Father, we pray, God, you're just your protection upon them. God, surround them with your hedge of protection, Lord, and lead and guide and direct them. And Lord, and we pray. God, just for them and for their family and all that is going to take place in their life. 
So again, we thank you for these dear saints. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Y'all want to make sure you say bye to them before they go. Amen.